It's quite common today for people to spend almost every waking hour in front of some sort of a screen. And this over the course of many years. So what are we doing to our eyes? In this conversation, I speak with Dr. Alex Muntz, clinical scientist and research fellow in the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. From unusual anatomy to the mites with exploding butts that live in our eyelashes, we discuss all the things you might've never known about your own eyes. I'm Shane Farnsworth, and this is a special episode of the Escape Sapiens podcast, made in collaboration with the Bucharest Science Festival to spread the joy of science. These conversations are supported by the Andrea von Braun Foundation. If you like what I'm doing, please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing this content. And now, here's Alex Muntz. I hope you enjoy. Escape Sapiens. Alex Muntz. Welcome on the podcast. Cheers, Shane. Good to be here. Thank I, you for having me. I think that's the first time I've said your name correctly in the many years I've known you. No, you haven't, but that's all right. You'll, uh, you'll, you'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a few, there are two main goals that I want to get to in this conversation. So to start with, I want to find out what our digital lifestyles are doing to our eyes. What is looking at a screen for eight hours, nine hours, 10 hours or more per day do to us? How bad is it? So that's the first sort of topic I want to get to ultimately. And the other thing I want to do is I, I, I really just want to, I know that you work in clinical trials, so I want to know the ins and outs of, of that. So from the disgusting through to the fantastic. So that's sort of the, the two sort of things that I want to touch on today. Um, but I thought it would be, a good idea to start somewhere a little bit simpler. So, so you're an optometrist working in an ophthalmology department. For people who don't know those words, what do they mean and what do you do? Right, very adequate question. We, we, we often wonder that ourselves. Um, the ophthalmologist is your eye doctor, right? There's a medical, uh, uh, medical professional, medical training uh, who's specialized in eye care. They'll do surgery, and in some countries, they'll even check your eyes, uh, prescribe glasses, and so forth. The optometrist is a um, uh, is your primary eye care uh, provider in 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 many countries, particularly in the English speaking world. So any eye related issue you'll have, you'll go to your optometrist. Mostly it'll be glasses, contact lenses, stuff like that, but also, you know, diagnosing any disease or any discomfort, any issue you might have. And they might refer you to an eye doctor if needed, but they, optometrists, can basically deal with, you know, 80, 90% of all issues uh, relating to eyes. The other profession that the optometrist kind of sandwiches in between the ophthalmologist and is the optician. So your, your, your traditional, um, guy or a girl that will manufacture and create the glasses and 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 is more of a, a crafty um uh, profession but the optometrist is kind of kind of in between uh and is your all round person for all things eyes really so why why did you decide to go into eye health specifically and why so you do research you don't work with patients directly so why why the research route rather than the clinical route that's right uh it was it was all uh, i guess really uh, really good intentions on behalf of uh um the deciding uh, people in my life at a time where i had absolutely no clue what i want to do with my life other than music um and who've uh, pointed me towards uh, eye care because that's what you know the the, the family was into at a time um, and i've enjoyed the training and then time came for me to practice an opto as an optometrist um, and i've done that for a whole uh, three four weeks i think uh, to realize <laughs> that yes this is not what i want to do um, and roughly at around the same time i was lured into the into the world of research um, and i found that really exciting and uh, one thing led to another, and I'm now a research fellow in, in ophthalmology. Um, I've done a master's and a, and a PhD in, in vision science, which is kind of like the overarching term extending from optometry into all things eyes, but, but, but looking into the scientific aspects of, of eyes and vision. Um, and yeah, this is what I've done for the past, gosh, 15 years. Um, so I've not worked with patients directly in a care providing capacity, but I do work with with um, with a clinical with participants with study participants uh, in clinical settings. So basically, doing everything that an optometrist, occasionally an eye doctor, might do, 
but without diagnosing and prescribing treatment. It's just doing it for the research, for the science. Okay, so, so you have, so that means you have a large lab where you take participants in and, and what do you, what do you do? You, you have companies that have particular drugs or medication that you will trial. Or, so what, what do you do in your work in the lab sort of as a day to day? That's uh, right. Thing? I guess, I guess work could fall into two broad categories. Um, obviously this is, this is in an academic setting. So you know, there's, there's the, the whole, you know, freedom that comes with that and choosing your topics and your research questions. And a lot of those trials are what we call, um, um, you know, they may be student projects. And a lot of the student projects actually evolve into something that's really, you know, of high quality and publishable and turns into solid research. Um, but when it comes to the bigger trials that we do, uh, there's, there's a category that's called uh, IITs or investigator initiated trials. This is where us as academics come forward and say, hey, this is a really cool question, we, research question we have. Here's a new product, here's a new drug. And then we go out and, and, and seek funding or obtain funding from companies who are willing to, to give that funding to us, but have no say or influence in the design and the analysis and the publication of the, of the results. So um, aside from your traditional scientific funding route, which is usually government funding, there's, there's a lot of int uh, industry interest in this. Uh, and with these IITs, they basically bring no influence. They're interested in the, in, in the advancement of science or scientific questions, um, you know, without direct benefit or gain to the to the specific company and then the other category is is what we call contract research where mm -hmm. um a company might come forward and say we have this new product uh we have this old product but the competition has come up with a new one uh could you please uh compare them in a randomized control trial wait so that means you're 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 looking into drugs that are already out on the market bef so so are you are you sort of the last line before people get the product or are, are you working with products, you know, after the fact, people already have it in their eyes and now you're seeing whether it's okay. How yeah. does that work? Yeah, yeah, that, 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 that might happen. So, so, uh, with, with medical devices, uh, so, uh, this could take hours or days for us to discuss, um, because it, it gets very legal and very technical and it's, it is actually not my field, but, um, but, uh, we, when we look at medical devices as different classes, right? So a, um, a, a bandaid, um, compared to a, say a contact lens compared to, a an, uh, um, you know, an IV needle or a pacemaker. These are all medical devices, but of different classes and different requirements. Drugs would, would fall somewhere along that line too. And then authorities such as the FDA, the Food and Drug um, Administration in, in the States, would have different requirements for those medical devices. So depending on the type of device or drug or product that you, that you want to launch as a company, um, you have to go through different phases of trials. And there's what we call phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. Um, it can get really complicated, but basically they're, they're, they're in our field, in our area, there, there are plenty of products or devices that pose no great harm, you know, or great risk, if not, you know, uh, tested to, to the same level that, say, a pacemaker might have to be tested, right? Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's easy to come out with, to launch a product, basically proving that it does no harm. It may or may not work, but that's, you know, that's, that, that doesn't prevent, or the authorities don't prevent these companies to come up with these devices because they've proven they do no harm. It, there may be some benefit. But then these companies have a lot of interest in, in, in actually obtaining independent sound scientific evidence to prove that it does hopefully does or doesn't work. Um, so that's that's one route. And, and and other trials we're involved in obviously involve prototypes or, or products that we help develop. Um, yeah. Have you have you ever found a product that, uh, <laughs> despite the fact that these are products that shouldn't be doing it, have you ever found something that was harmful? Or, or how often do you find things that are just completely useless that people are buying? Uh, it, it, it hasn't happened in, in my personal experience, uh, to date. If not, I've not seen that. Well, what, you know, my, there's a, there's a big question here because a lot of the, the newer products, um, 
as you might imagine, in, in, in the medical. Now, obviously, you know, for instance, with COVID vaccines, we've seen everything expedited and, and concentrated and s staggered and done to an incredible pace. And we were able to obtain good quality data in a relatively short amount of time that otherwise would have taken 10, 20 years. This is with vaccines, right? This is like the highest level. Many of the clinical trials we, we do, and I must say this, and it sounds terrible, are not you know the best they can be because we do not have billions of dollars at our disposal to, disposal to design trials that are 10, 20 years long. So, so it may be a case of you know, you've tested a product or a new device for maybe a month or a single application and you might see some differences. But, but the really good quality trials come in when you, when you start looking at long-term use. And in our case mm -hmm. specifically, if you look at something like artificial tears, a lot of these stuff I do is, is ocular surface or eye surface disease where people put in a drop to lubricate their eyes, right? Uh, and then they go, oh, wait, this doesn't work. And one of the latest trials we've done, we've tested it for six months. It's the longest trial ever done um, in, in, in this area. And we've sound, found some pretty amazing and, and, and scientifically actually quite sound and, 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 and logical or, 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 or evident sort of answers that we couldn't have obtained before uh, in the absence of such solid trials. Um, so there's different levels of evidence, I guess. Um, and and, and, and that's, that's where the differences come in. Uh, it's a it's a progress. It's a slow trickle. So, so what's the dream sort of thing you can you know in in physics? Maybe you want to find a law, or you you, know, you want to find out how this fundamental thing works. You know, um, what's the sort of thing that would be most exciting for you to find? Like this, the sort of thing that really makes it big in your field. What's what's the dream finding for you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... Oh, there'll be plenty. We've never had the luxury to even consider such a question. Um, <laughs> I've, not, I've not allowed myself to dream that far. Uh, but I guess one, um, uh, an ideal um, outcome might be a, uh, a more fundamental understanding of this complex condition that we're interested in or that we're, we're, we're analyzing, which is dry eye disease. Um, a better understanding of its its highly multifactorial nature. So we're dealing with an extremely complex system with with dozens and dozens of, of risk factors. So understanding how each and every person might be at, at risk uh, for this condition, um, and then and then because it's a relatively new field, I'm talking 50 years. Um, having a more unified and consensus based definition. Uh, which I guess is 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 a, is a is a result out of a of, out of a shared whole understanding of what this disease is. It's not like I don't know having a fever where we all pretty much know. <laughs> Although I bet, and this is again not my area, but I bet that there's stuff that we absolutely have no clue how what fear means or how we sleep. You know, so understanding sleep. So 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 yeah, I guess I guess a better understanding of how how the different risk factors that lead to this condition interact and being able to predict them. And ideally, maybe coming up with it with a quick and easy test, you know, a diagnostic mm -hmm. test. Uh, actually, here's here's the short answer. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, to step uh, to take a step back, though, <laughs> I asked if if you've ever found something that's damaging or, or that uh, just did nothing. Have you ever had the reverse happen? So, for example, you you do it. How how large are your trials? Like five or how many people? Like a, a thousand, two hundred. Oh, I think the largest we've we've done was was somewhere up around two hundred, uh, maybe twenty, forty, fifty, hundred. Two hundred is a big one. Okay. So, have you ever had a situation where you? I'm guessing. So, how how do you get your? Is it um, people who are actually sick, or it's mainly students at the university, or who who participates in the trials? It's a it's a mix. Uh, f f for most trials, um, I guess the general public uh, is, is our target audience. So there we might advertise internally. It might be students, staff at the university, um, patients that run through the clinic and see the advertisements, pretty much anyone. And then for specific trials, if you're looking at a specific condition or a specific treatment targeted as a subform of the condition, then you might target someone with that condition. And then you'd have to screen it and it gets a bit more, more complicated there. But, but have you ever had a situation where, for instance, you, you, you have a, a medication which is being trialed and it really helps people in the trial. 
and they're very happy that they participated. Have you ever had a situation along those lines? Absolutely, yeah. It most uh, it, it very frequently happens actually that we trial you know brand new things and and then uh, before you know before we run the analysis and before the data is in, um, people do actually report uh, benefits. Um, and then we've had a few occasions where the product wasn't even available on the market and people were desperate to to get their hands on it because this was so amazing and and and. Uh, as said, you know, we don't provide care uh, in a traditional setting, but quite often a byproduct of taking part of these trials is uh, having access to the latest treatments, be a prototype or launched already. Some of these uh, these treatments are quite costly, and in a trial, obviously, you will get it for free. Uh, but that comes with the risk in a randomized control trial of being assigned to the placebo group, which which can be a bit annoying, especially if it's a six-month-long trial, right? And then at the very end, we disclose whether you had a treatment or not. Then you usually have the option of getting the real tr uh, treatment. And and quite often, people do do, do experience benefits. Uh, other times, they don't. But but that's the anecdotal stuff, uh, which is quite powerful on, on a a personal level working with these patients um, but ultimately it's it's the data that we are we're, we're interested in um, but there's never situations where you go you know halfway through the trial you, you realize this is really working and it's you know from an ethical position we really should be placing everyone on this drug or have you ever had we've not had that uh, situation and we've not been involved with with trials at that level where the question is uh, is that uh, the other issue to consider is that for most, or the majority, if not all of our participants or patients, uh, you know, dry disease is not your typical debilitating condition where it's a matter of life or death. Uh, it comes with 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 a pretty, you know, it can be a pretty significant um, uh, decrease in quality of life. Um, but the other aspect to consider is that there's no cure to this to this condition, right? So you can only manage it and improve improve the symptoms and and kind of taper the the progression a bit. Um, I want to I want to uh, get into dry eye and, and looking at screens, mm. this sort of thing, mm. in a little bit. But I thought beforehand, I, I know that you work with uh, these mites, or you, you've you've done research on, on these mites that are on people's faces. It, I, I don't. Can you can you just say what they are? Does everyone have these mites, or what, yeah, what are they? Yeah. Can we take a moment to to um, to let anyone who's uh, potentially sensitive to the topic to walk out of a room? Just. Uh... Just in case, <laughs> uh, so now is your chance because it'll get it'll get nasty. Uh, I can also, uh, for those who are watching the video, I can place things on screen uh, if you uh, have any images. Mm, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I've worked on a few trials in, in in that area, and for the first two three weeks of dealing with these mites, uh, my nightmares were nothing nothing like i've ever seen but yes we all harbor mites that feed feast uh and reproduce in and around our eyes um and it's 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 uh they're not they're not very small uh they're called demodex so they're called demodex mites uh, they can grow up to about half a mil in length and they, uh, up until recently, we thought, uh, you know, they're they're more common in older people and some people who have skin issues. They're quite common in conditions such as rosacea or the inflammation of the eyelids, blepharitis and stuff. And we still don't know whether the mites cause the condition or the other way around. So it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a mystery. But they play a role in the progression of these skin diseases. Um, and they basically feed off the the oils on your on your face and in around your eyes, and especially on your eyes, you have a special kind of oil, um, also around your scalp, in your nose, in your ears, and that's where they like to hang out. Now around your eyes, because you also have your eyelashes and there's more stuff going on, um, they really like to dig themselves deep in there. And here comes the the really cool part: they're they're nocturnal, right? So mm -hmm. daytime. They're, they're inside, you, you won't see them. Uh, but at night they come out and they will seek a new follicle, usually a hair follicle where your eyelashes grow because they're nice and deep and there's a lot of sebum um, and, and other oil and byproducts produced. And they dig themselves in head first, in, butt out. I have some great pictures. Uh, and then they, start, they, they lay their eggs uh, and then they start growing. Uh, and you can imagine a tapeworm, if you will, or, 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 a, or, a, or a worm. Um, and their butt just keeps growing. 
up to about half a mil, 0.6, 0.7, 0.8. Uh, but they lack an anus. So they, uh, their feces remain within them until they reach their cycle. Um, and then they uh, explode. And all of those feces uh, remain and they use the, 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 the upcoming cycle, the next ones, basically use all of that and the byproducts and the sebum and all the guck around your eyes to create these seals around your eyelashes that basically seal themselves off. And in there, in the follicle, they can continue reproducing and growing and feeding off of the hair follicle of your eyelash or other you know, hair around your face, but it's mostly the eyelashes. Once they're done, once that all fed up, they will come out at night, seek a new follicle, get in there, lay their eggs, start growing, pooping, exploding, and the whole cycle continues. And if it's not controlled, this condition can lead to um, your eyelashes falling out um, and just sort of irritation, tickling sensations, um, and this is what we what we call demodex blepharitis. And up until recently, we thought, you know, mostly people with this condition only or older people, we tend to find pretty much everyone over 60, 70 will, will have them quite, quite visibly. But uh, latest research actually proves pretty definitively that everyone has them. And they're just part of the normal um, fauna um, or your, 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 your general face microbiome but that they're mostly harmless. We can live with these mites, um, but they're magnified. They're quite uh, frightening. They have this long tail. They've got uh, four pairs of hands and they move them around like this. Uh, and they've got a, got a pretty vicious mouth with strong teeth to bite into all of that tissue and they uh, crawl around. Uh, and they're quite fast and they've been a fascination in the clinical world for hundreds of years. Uh, but there's still uh, still a bit of a mystery. And yes, we, we got mites around our eyes, pooping them their way around our eyes. But so their life cycle ends literally when they explode yeah. and their own feces just goes everywhere. Yeah, yeah. And then their children live in that. Why do they have to go from follicle to follicle? Why can't they stay in the one they're in? Is it that it fills up with mice and that they move along and... I guess, I mean, what happens, they, 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 they like to feed off that sebum and, and also the hair follicle. And after a while, um, after that's consumed, the, eyel the eyelash will, will just fall off. And we have patients where you just, I mean, if you pluck your eyelashes and pull them, they're quite rigid, right? They're not going to come off. But these patients, you just pull an eyelash and you just literally take it out because it has normal hold. The, the eyelash is dead. So once that bulb of the follicle is all eaten up, they're, you know, they're, they're looking for the new one. And I guess at some point they become aware of their own disgusting nature and well, all right, let's just find a cleaner place. Um, but so we all, what's the difference between, for example, you and I, we have our eyelashes. There's no, we don't, we don't seem to notice these mites. What, what's the difference between us and it's just more mites or, yeah. or what's going on there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, again, we don't entirely understand what drives, uh, this, uh, this, this more excessive growth in, in, in the mites and what we call, uh, Demodex farms. Uh, we mm -hmm. shouldn't, uh, but there's obviously. I say obviously an imbalance in the um, in the skin's um, production of, of 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 oils of the bacterial byproducts that reside because because we're learning increasingly that the microbiome around your eyes is extremely complex, kind of like in your mouth, kind of like in your gut, um, and there's a lot going on. And 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 as with many conditions that that affect the microbiome elsewhere in the body or on our skin, it's just a matter of imbalance. But because there's there's bazillions of species, we are not there yet in understanding which excess in this bacterium or that might favor the 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 um the um uh, uh growth of these mites in one person or the other so so that we we don't really know we we know that age is a, is a risk factor and that's pretty consistent uh but otherwise um we don't what patients might notice is is this tickling tickling sensation or more excessive guck in the morning uh that tickling sensation early in the morning uh that kind of stuff red swollen eye, uh, eyelids usually good indication and the and the diagnosis is 
pretty straightforward. An eye doctor or an optometrist can just use their uh, microscope, um, their slit lamp eye microscope, their regular eye microscope to to, to visually assess them. And we've actually uh, developed a, a pretty cool um, improvement in a diagnostic technique where we grab a, a um, an eyelash with a pair of tweezers, a forceps, and looking under the microscope, uh, this is in vivo, right? So you just close your eyes and the eye doctor will pluck an eyelash and just gently push it to the side. And you, you can actually, looking at the follicle, if this is your eyelash, right, coming out of your follicle, uh, by tensioning that eyelash, you can actually see, I don't have enough fingers, but if you imagine these fingers is kind of tails of mites just sticking out slowly you can you can make them come out it's it's pretty horrid and in extreme cases and people who have a lot because you might have upwards of five or seven mites in the follicle and the, the, the tails just kind of start fanning out like that when you pull towards you uh and occasionally a mite will just pop out and fly out and land on another eyelash and it'll be like um yeah <laughs> but what is the medication similar to other things like scabies and yeah yeah yeah, you can. So use, it's uh, it's the same sort of treatment. Similar, yeah. So anti anti parasitic treatments, something like ivermectin, and it, but it's interesting. <laughs> uh, so, and there's other more 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 um, uh, uh, you know better better ways, I guess, like something like tea tree oil um, that can mm. apply. You you can find soap uh, and shampoo with tea tree oil, um, and basically you need to bathe in the stuff for 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 about you know six six to eight weeks to catch the, the whole life cycle to kind of bring it under control the thing is if you then stop and if you have a predisposition for growth they'll come back <clears throat> so it's a case because of because they're on your partner's face or yeah yeah um exactly and and it, again if you have a predisposition and you don't control it they they might come back i mean it's not you know we might prescribe something that's topical for the eyes but they are still around your scalp and around your ears um so you might have to come back every couple of months to do another treatment to to um uh to bring it under control but it's mostly only if if, if they do create symptoms as said most of the times uh people live quite happily with them what's interesting though is that there's all sorts of species of demodex uh, but there's only two that are known for or 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 that apply to humans but there's many others that affect animals and they're and they're lethal so dogs and, and cows and, and, and other cats um, that get demodex infestation actually is, is, is a lethal condition. Uh, so it's quite interesting that we're, um, we're, uh, we're partners with our demodex. We it? live happily with our... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they don't seem to fulfill any, any obvious role in, in, a, in a healthy, um, healthy person. So yeah, uh, there's, there's really cool... Uh, research and even poems from the 1700s about 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 mites and then research done in the 20s and 30s and 40s that's very um inspiring and very um poetic if you will uh, what people knew about this yeah all the way back then yeah 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 yeah. only recently we're, we're starting to understand more but we're still you know dealing with the main questions like what's the role what do they cause or what are they caused by so yeah, they've been a they've been a mystery for 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 a long long time. I once heard this story about a lady who left her contact. I think they were temporary contacts and uh, or like one use, whatever you call them. And she left them in for days. And the story was that she developed a layer of bacteria, and then there was a, some sort of a mite that lived on her eyes that then buried into her lens to get to the bacteria. Is this? Is this like an old wives' tale? Do you, do you ever hear about this sort of thing? Like, what, what is the danger of leaving contacts in for prolonged periods? Possibly. Uh, I mean, the uh, w the worm is yeah is, is a bit far fetched, probably. But 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 who knows? I mean, it's it's surely not just the contact lens. Um, if it was the Amazon River, you know, I don't know. But uh, leaving your contacts in for for extended periods of time against the advice there are contacts that you can wear for extended periods overnight uh but with proper care and, and, and advice from 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 your eye care professional but, but leaving your contacts in is 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 the worst thing you can do for your eyes speaking from experience i can't wear contacts anymore uh the 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 the, 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 the byproducts the metabolic byproducts the bacteria all the stuff that your your eyes will usually flush out uh remain behind that lens trapped 
right? Mm-hmm. So, so that needs to rinse out within minutes, but that gets trapped there for hours or days. Uh, and that can create pretty nasty adverse reactions. And then there's all sorts of other uh, um, uh, uh, bacterial infections that, that are quite aggressive and attack the, uh, uh, the cornea. And that can lead to scarring that essentially leads to blindness or requiring a corneal transplant. Not fun, not worth, not worth that party. Uh, don't do it yeah chuck them out chuck them out uh also really bad idea to use tap water uh or uh, saliva um fall on the ground best to give it a good rinse so yeah hygiene is quite quite important and in people who do not um do not comply with hygiene of course you know you'll always see it people will get get quite complacent they'll be fine but but the the more of the nasty things you do the more the risk increases of contracting one of these bacterial infections that can be quite vicious. And we've seen some pretty nasty cases. Um, Where you actually lose your vision entirely. Yeah, or... yeah, 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 yeah. It can, it can, you know, the perforating conditions, where, whether you're a cornea, which is, you know, this really soft, sensitive, important tissue that's avascular, right? So there's no blood vessels. So any damage, any issue, any infiltration, any infection um, is is quite tricky because there's no blood that can get there. So it's all through diffusion. Um, and mm. and healing process is much slower. It's much more tricky. And even if it does, if, if any scarring is left behind, uh, that will always, always um, impair your vision. It's like taking a piece of straight plastic and crumpling together and then folding back up, you'll always have a bit of a, so it's, uh, yeah, it's no fun. These, these um, worms you see in your eye, you know, when you look out and you see sort of these floaters yeah. or whatever they're called, yeah. is, is that something in the cornea? Or what is that? That's back in your vitreous. So your, your, your eyeball is, is divided into two main parts, um, basically separated by your iris. So if this is the front part of the eye, this is your cornea. Um, how do we do this? I'll, I'll put a picture on the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Put a picture on the screen. So you have at the front of the eye, let's go from front to back. You have your cornea. Uh, then you have what we call the anterior chamber. Uh, and then there's your iris, right? So you can see through the black hole. Uh, and then and then the iris is your colorful bit that surrounds your pupil, basically. And just behind that is the crystalline lens that allows you to look far and look near. Um, so that's the front part, which is just like, 10% of the, the length of the eye, 15%. And then the big part at the back is what we call the vitreous, which is this gooey gel-like liquid um, that fills up the bulk of the eye and keeps it in, in tension like a, like a filled up balloon. And at the very back, you have your retina where your receptors are. Uh, and these floaters are um, um, basically leftovers from the em- em- embryonic stage development of the eye where there might be proteins or there might be strands of tissue that are just floating about and 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 uh you can if you if you if you if you if you pay attention you can actually play with them uh, and if you <laughs> stare straight ahead usually into the sun or a blue sky or something they'll be quite still they might float but if you do a, a quick flick of your eye you'll see them float away and then they'll come back so so they're they're yeah they're tiny bits of stuff um, in your eye that float about and for some people I mean some people might, might might have quite a lot you might get more if you have a condition or a, or a, you know some 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 injury um, and it you know it may require surgery for most people they're just fascinating little things to entertain ourselves when we're bored so I'm not crazy in thinking that I recognize the shapes of the floaters over no the not at all not at all there's there's beautiful paintings and drawings again going back a hundred years of, of artists who've taken the time to actually draw them and paint them, and and you'll and you'll look at these 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 pictures and diagrams, and we'll go, like, yes, this is it, like this is it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. All right, so I want to jump into. <laughs> that's a good intro. You... That's that's a good intro. I think a scientific paper should have this kind of an intro to lure the person in. You know, this just is, uh, floaters and what was it called? De- Demetrox? Demodex. 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 Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I want to ask you, so if, as an optometrist, our digital lifestyle, you know, when we're, so for, personally, sometimes I work an eight hour day at work and then I'll do <laughs> maybe four or five hours afterwards on the podcast or something else like this. So it's easy for me to rack up 12 hours a day in front of the the screen, right? And then you got your mobile phone. 
this is this is great What's... meme. This is great meme I've seen, or was it a tweet I've seen the other day that thank thank God that my workday is over. Staring at the medium screen, I can finally go home to look at the big screen, and then I can go to bed to look at the small screen. It's... And sit on the toilet and yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> look, read the mobile. But the yeah. So, so what's your, as an optometrist, what's your view on our digital, like, is, is this healthy? <laughs> like, what, what are we doing to ourselves? Um, well, um, it remains to be seen what we are doing to ourselves long term, because I think uh, you and I could agree that this, you know, digital lifestyle, extended screen time in our daily lives hasn't been around for that long. It's been around for a couple of years, but... But I think we can we can remember pen and paper and 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 but 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 the new generation isn't right. So that's that's I guess the the more important question. Um, but the reality is that as you say, as you say, anyone watching and listening to this knows that feeling of your eyes after a long day in front of the screen being dry and gritty and kind of burning or ticklish or watering even. Um, and then you have a good night's sleep and you wake up and you're fine, right? So so we have a pretty good. Uh, what we call physiological um, reserve eyes recover, right? Uh, essentially, if you you know if you if you keep your eyes open for too long, because this is what a screen will do, or any cognitively demanding task. If you if you go into surgery, if you're going to perform surgery now on someone, please don't. I guarantee that you will not blink for minutes at a time, right? So so if you're doing if you're engaged in a very uh, you know if you're doing high level maths. Uh, you'll blink less because FOMO. Blink and you miss it, right? Your 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 body is just is just operating at a higher level where where that function of blinking is suppressed. You blink about ten thousand times each day on average. You're not even aware of it, right? That's our average blink rate, ten thousand times a day. When you're doing screen time, um, and not all screen time is the same. A first person shooter will be different to reading a PDF, of course. But during screen time, that value can drop by ninety percent. So you can end up blinking once a minute or so. If you stop blinking now, you'll 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 get dry eyes, right? Your eyes start watering and, and screaming at you, please blink, because that sensitive cornea we've talked about has got you know the highest density of nerves uh, in, in in any you know any tissue in the human body, right? It is essential. We're visual creatures. We need to see. So blinking is a protective mechanism to clean it, to cover it, to to replenish the tears that cover the eye surface. So if you do a lot of screen time, you'll blink less. And after a long day of losing staring contests, essentially, you'll end up with that dry uh, sensation because the eyes haven't been covered in tears and cle cleansed as, as often as, as, as they'd like it to be. Um, now, in some people, we see that excessive screen time does lead to the same symptoms, clinical symptoms we have. Um, dedicated tools to measure symptoms like validated questionnaires and clinical signs like objective clinical signs we we can see on the eye uh, or in the tears that um, are used to describe this condition that we've talked about dry eye disease which is which is a a a a, a condition a recognized condition mm -hmm. and that seems to be driven by excessive screen time in adults but also we're seeing this in younger people and this is where a lot of my work falls in but basically screen time or excessive screen time is um, is a risk factor, is increasingly recognized risk factor for the onset and the progression of dry disease. And dry disease is a condition that has been typically associated with aging, usually people in their 60s and 70s. As was most most things in the body, you know, you know, things start giving up um, on you, teeth, uh, and and everything else. And, and, and your eyes kind of, you know, start start acting up too. But increasingly, we're seeing this condition affect younger people in their 40s, 30s, but also teenagers and young people. Uh, this is where, 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 where a lot of our work uh, uh, comes in. So it sounds like it's... See, this is one thing that I was wondering about. When I have eye strain, I was wondering if it was something to do with sort of the muscles in my eyes getting tired because I'm looking at a screen which is at sort of the same distance the whole day rather than mm. looking at different objects and mm. different... But so this is primarily to do with the lack of blinking that's right so is, is that why when i'm watching so you said it's it's related to how much i mentally engage with something so when when i'm i notice that when i'm watching some dumb show that i don't care about so much uh i can do that for hours with no problems with my eye but if i'm like really working that's when i start 
feeling pain. In, so, so that's what's happening there. I'm, I'm when I'm relaxed, I, I'm not necessarily as prone to to uh, these sort of symptoms. Exactly. Yeah. And and then I mean the the, the added thing is added, the, the other thing is that if you're watching an easy show, you might be doing something else in between. You might walk around. You might look mm-hmm. around. You might have a bit of a conversation. Might be on your phone. Uh, you look around, right? Your eyes, other than you know maybe having a decrease in blinking, your your eyes are quite relaxed. You're d- looking at different distances. You might not be up here, right? But if you're doing hardcore baths or 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 you're 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 gaming um, for eight hours or ten hours you are focused in a very you know singular direction at a, at a, at a close distance uh blinking less um and the muscle so basically keeping things in focus for your eye requires some muscle work so looking at something far away versus up close there's fine muscles around your iris around the colorful part that compress or or relax that crystalline lens and that's just like any other muscle in in your body. If you're supposed to hold your 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 phone or, or or pen here for eight hours a day, your arm get tired. So that's part of the, the part of the eye pain you're feeling, or the headache, or the tension. And it's all a system. Obviously, some people get neck uh, tension and shoulder pain and 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 all these things. Um, but visually, yes, it is. It is the task. It is the lighting. It is the proximity. It is the size of the screen. Um, yeah. And your bigger and, or better for is bigger better for the screen. Like bigger should people be getting um, always better. But always should people better. act? Should they be getting the big desktop top screen? Is is this actually recommended? There's, I think, there's limits to that. Um, there's there's fresh research coming out on that, but it's 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 very um, in very early stages. I think what we're seeing is that with these massive screens, that's also a bit of a strain on on the eyes. What you want is some some happy medium, uh, but generally, yes. You know, a lot of work on a smartphone uh, is is a bit more tiring on the eyes because it's much smaller. The level of detail is much smaller, so your focus is a bit is a bit higher. Um, I see. You you hold it closer to you need to focus on at, at a shorter distance. So generally, yes, you know, we, we there's a rule of thumb we we use for kids. You know, fist to the eye. Keep your fist to the eye where your elbow is. Your screen shouldn't be any closer. Now, obviously, if it's a phone, a lot of times you'll see the kids just being up here because they're in there um what you want is 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 a bit of a distance 40 60 centimeters um laptops tablets yeah. um, but but but, but, so what, but what is but, it yeah no go, go on no it's it, it's a mix because because it's you know it's it's easy to take one one thing one aspect so just the size but then the task you do is 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 really important, right? Um, the amount of time. So all the other factors um, uh, that that flow into this, it's it's really hard to disentangle. And oftentimes people go, oh, well, what's the maximum amount of time I should spend on the screen a day? It's it's tough to say. If you're if you're writing, if you're reading all day, it's very different to if you're if you're if you're playing Quake. Do people still play Quake? I don't know. Not sure. No. <laughs> Half life. <don't> <laughs> Showing our age, but yeah. the okay. But this might be some one of the reasons why we're somehow resilient to looking at screens for ten hours a day, fourteen mm. hours a day, mm. because people have been concentrating on things for a long time. This isn't new, mm. uh, right? So, so this might actually be a protect. It, it's not so different to reading a book, perhaps, uh, mm. with great concentration for many, many hours. That's right. The, the the difference comes comes in when when you realize that um, <laughs> what used to be excessive screen time during lockdowns has 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 become or has been the norm for many of us, including for uh, for the youngest. Whereas before, yes, we 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 knew that extended uh, visual tasks such as reading or knitting will drive another condition that we can talk about, which is myopia or short-sightedness, right? In the 1700s, we knew that students of law and medicine will tend to have higher degrees of short-sightedness or myopia. They'll need glasses after completing the studies because of the amount they read uh, compared to, you know, other other people. So, so, so near work, any kind of near work, extended near work, will drive the progression of, of, of myopia or short-sightedness. The problem with, with the digital lifestyle is that while, yes, you may be at work and doing, you know, you're doing paper-based work, say, in the, in the 60s, um, 
it's 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 it screens from dusk till dawn, right? It's 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 it screens mm. all throughout. Whether it's leisure, whether it's communication for kids, whether it's education, a lot of schools in many parts of the world now are going fully digital. Homework is digital. Then you game. Then you you know read. So so it's all there. So so the the visual environment has changed a lot. While we might have read for an extended period of time in the past, you would have taken a walk, you would have had a chat, you, your eyes would have gotten a break. But now we don't. And a lot of the evidence we're seeing um, emerging in this young population that, you know, in the last 10, 15 years was born into a world where there's tablets from day zero, start showing some of the same signs and symptoms we see in aging aging populations, where a condition such as dry disease, which is associated with an aging process, is now occurring in 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 a ten year old. So so the same the same signs and symptoms that are associated with an aging process with 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 the body just kind of going its natural way, if you will, tooth loss. If your teeth start falling out when you're seventy, well, good luck. You know that's you know you know you've had a you've had a good run. But if your teeth start falling out in, in, in your teens, ah, there's maybe you're maybe having too much sugar. So in a sense, and I and I want to be cautious about this and not too alarmist or, or apocalyptic, in a sense, and for some people, and which is why this is going back to what I was saying at the very beginning, it'll be nice to understand who's more at risk than others. In a sense, some people seem to be um, experiencing the same uh, that you know we might have with sugar to your teeth with 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 extended screen time um, and and a lot of evidence is coming out to, to say just that now we don't have you know longitudinal data to, to see what this does to them in their 30s 40s 50s 60s but the dri- the trajectories we're seeing are are uh, if not concerning then interesting <laughs> so so what what is it then so so what's the difference between me having strained eyes, I go to bed and wake up in the morning, fine. What's the difference between that? Like what's actually, what, what is the outcome? What, what does dry eye disease actually look like? How, how bad is it? How can, what, what are the symptoms? Can I lose my vision ultimately? What, what, what's yeah. going on? Yeah. So, so broadly speaking, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's one of the most common eye conditions. So, so, so it's one of the most common complaints in any eye care setting and people will come in, it's like, oh, my eyes are watering or my eyes are dry or there's some level of discomfort. And, and depending on where you place needle, and we're working a lot to, to, to pinpoint what dry disease is, because if I ask this question, have you ever had dry-ish eyes, then yes, everyone will have dry disease. It's not like that. So we're trying to develop a definition. But by the current definitions we have, 30, 30, 30 to 40, 50% of, of the world's population will have some form of that at a certain point in their lives. Um, well, for most people, it's mild to moderate. So at the end of the day, they'll be like, gosh, my eyes are killing me. Like, this is just, oh, I just need to get some shut eye. For some people, it can get quite severe. Uh, and it's a chronic progressive condition that has no cure. And in these people, this uh, dry disease is associated with anxiety, with depression. We have patients who are suicidal. Um, it, it, its impact has been likened to angina or dialysis. So so it can be quite debilitating because you literally can't open your eyes. You, you know, you need to keep your eyes shut because of that burning sensation you'll feel if you keep your eyes open for two minutes now, they'll sting and burn and they'll do everything possible to make you shut your eyes, right? So if, 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 you're, if your eyes are acting up that bad, you are confined to your home. You can't work. You can't leave the house. You're effectively blind, if you will. And we've seen plenty of patients who, who experience just that be it in their 60s or in their 20s or 30s. These are more rare conditions, but 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 we're 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 seeing more of them. And and what ultimately happens in these younger people who present these signs of of damage because one part is the symptoms you're experiencing and as I said that we have questionnaires that we fill out it's like how often how, you know how frequent how intense when do you get this whole sorts of questions you get a score and depending on where that score sits you're more likely to have it or not and then also this clinical signs where we actually see damage on the front surface of the eye that will often resolve with a good night's sleep but in in cases where this is pathologic it doesn't and one of the main features we're looking at is um is the what we call the meibomian glands so um you have sebaceous glands on your skin that produce the oils. Mm-hmm. Around your eyes, um, at your lid margins, you have what we call meibomian glands. So not uh, sebaceous glands, but meibomian glands. So these produce meibum, which is a different kind of oil 
than what you need for the skin. Because on your eye surface, you don't just need tears that we know from crying, which is water, and your tears are 90% water with a whole bunch of other stuff, but also oil. That oil is essential. It seals in that liquid, and it also lubricates the eye surface every time you blink. 10,000 blinks each day is about 400 meters of travel. Your upper lid does over the eye surface each day. 400 meters of travel. So you need you need good lube, right? Um, those meibomian glands uh, tend to drop out with age, kind of like with teeth again, which is why in your 60s and 70s, you're more likely to see people developing dry disease. What we start to understand, and this is a hypothesis, but there's increasing evidence pointing from different directions that this is happening, is that these meibomian glands are maintained by the blinking action. So you need to close your lids fully and for those 10,000 times each day. If you don't, because what happens when you blink, a tiny, tiny amount, so these these glands go all along your upper eyelid. They're kind of like, like, like fins, like teeth, all along your upper and lower eyelid. And they have openings around the lid margin. In order to express that oil that's needed on your eye surface, you need to blink fully. And that squeezes a tiny bit of oil onto the eye surface. And the blinking action spreads it. If you don't blink, no oil gets squeezed. Now, if you do that, if you do that for, 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 for long enough time, over days and months and years, those glands start to go, well, you know, I'm not needed. Uh, and then they start dropping out. And that dropout is irreversible. They don't come back. Mm -hmm. So these are tiny cells that produce these oils that either through lack of use or through obstruction, and that might happen with, um, again, with lack of blinking, all those byproducts are not washed away. And the entire environment on the eye and around the eye gets changed. And those fine openings that allow the oil to come out, those pores, if you will, get get blocked. So the oils get trapped in there, the pressure increases, and that pressure kills off these sensitive cells that produced the oils. And they're not coming back. There's no there's no growth back. Kind of like our teeth. They don't grow back, right? Unless we're sharks. So so this is what we're seeing in young people is that amongst populations who do or, or who at least report a lot of screen time we see more dropout than in others and unexpectedly high levels of gland dropout for their age okay. this is this is where it comes in so it's unusual to see this level of gland dropout at this young of an age um, which again gets you know correlates with with the symptoms of dry disease because if you have no oils we know symptoms just go down down the river it's just um, down the river? No, that's a German thing. <laughs> but but so if in in your lab you could uh, pull pull out the upper eyelid, say of, of the eye, and look underneath, and you can actually see these dying off, or is it something visual visual that you can see? That's okay, right. you've lost eighty percent. Yeah, it's a pretty cool image, and I can send you one. You can put on screen. Uh, if you take your eyelids and flip them around, kind of like we did when yeah. we were kids to to freak out our parents, uh, you expose the inside of your eyelid. And that's lined with a glance. You can't really see them with it with a naked eye, but if you use infrared light, you can see them because it's they're, they're quite translucent. So then you see the entire gland, and there's about 20, 30 glands lining the whole length or the whole surface of the, your eyelid, upper and lower. Um, and you can measure the extent of gland area versus dropout area. Uh, it's it's really quite cool. How did people find these? They they cut off someone's eyelid and then looked under a special light. Like, <laughs> I guess I guess you know you could kind of see them before, but then they thought, hey, uh, infrared light kind of penetrates a bit, uh, and that mm -hmm. tissue is, is is quite translucent. The conjunctiva or this tissue lining it is 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 pretty transparent. So hey, let's just shine some infrared light, um, and then and then you know obviously there's some I mean obviously there's there's a bit of image processing going on, so a bit of contrast enhancement, a bit of brightness adjustment and then they really pop out um, and they really look like kind of tiny squiggly worms my bobian glands you can check them out but i'll send you a picture but, but okay so so your eye when you blink you have a layer of oil that gets uh, placed across your eyes and underneath that is like a is i guess your tears which yep. are, is just like water and and so does this mean is this so does that mean um fake tears or eye drops they're not adequate because you, you don't get the oil from those. 
Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, exactly. For 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 the longest time, uh, artificial tear solutions, artificial tears were just um, water supplements. Um, so just some aqueous product with some extra stuff in there uh, that just gets flushed away. So uh, the eye is really efficient at, at flushing away everything it doesn't like or even stuff that it likes. So within a minute of you putting in a drop, 95, 98% of it is just all gone. Uh, in more recent years, we've under- we're starting to understand the role of this oil. Uh, up until now, we thought, I mean, the name says it, dry eye disease. But a lot of people with dry disease come in with watering eyes and we tell them you have dry eye. It's like, what do you mean? I have watering eyes. I don't have dry eyes. Uh, yes, you do. So it's a bit of a misnomer. Only in the last couple of dozen years, we're starting to understand that oil is actually really, really key. And a lot of the formulations now incorporate uh, an oily component uh, that seems to work quite well in, in a lot of these people that lack that oil. So... You said age is a risk factor. Looking at a screen, is, is, are there any others like diet? Is there any, you know, would you recommend people do anything or do different uh, ethnic groups get it? Or what, what, what are the risk factors? Yeah, great point. Uh, all, of the, all of these you've mentioned are, 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 are known risk factors and, um, and then they interact in mysterious ways and, and, and they're really tough to disentangle. That's why a good, um, a good assessment, a good thorough diagnosis by an eye care professional if you're if you're worried by this if it's something you're experiencing is is really crucial um to take a look at all of these because because there's intrinsic and extrinsic so there's stuff that 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 pertain to you age gender females are more likely um asian people uh for some reason that seems to have to do with the anatomy again with blinking and with attention in the eyelids um uh, certain genetic predispositions, certain conditions. They're, they're less likely or more likely? They're more likely to develop dry disease. Mm. Um, and and then extrinsic stuff or external stuff, um, the environment. If you spend your entire day in, in, in air conditioning, uh, air conditioned mm-hmm. um, uh, offices or cars, uh, dusty environments, uh, um, yeah, temperature, uh, medications, um uh, mentioned that um, contact lens wear uh, mm-hmm. alcohol smoking uh, there's there's diet uh, sleep hydration there's there's a lot um, <laughs> there's, there's really a lot but we're developing so we have we have pretty good pretty good tools to to assess these uh, and we're involved in in some quite interesting and statistically quite mind-numbing mm-hmm. uh, trials that look at um, uh, large cohorts worldwide to look at all these factors and try to disentangle them. But but amongst them, obviously there you know there's 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 different levels. But screen time is emerging as 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 a big one. Um, diet too, omega threes, omega six is a big one. If you have a crappy diet, uh, you're more likely to to experience that. And supplementing with with omega three, omega six, fish oil, that kind of stuff seems to seems to have a benefit. But but okay so so just so I understand so in 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 summary well not in summary but but the, one of the key points is that to diagnose someone with dry eye you would look at these glands under the eyelids and see the die off is is that the key thing that you would look for or what, what is the key thing you that that's one of them and remember when you've asked me what would be ideal in your field of a breakthrough would be one single test the problem is I mean part of the problem but it's also an advantage we have a battery of you know 10 15 20 tests we can do but currently the diagnosis of 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 the condition relies on symptoms using one or two validated questionnaires that give you a score Mm -hmm. and that there's a cutoff value for that and then uh certain clinical signs those glands are one of them but there's also damage to the eye surface where the eye doctor might look with the blue light uh, over your eyes mm-hmm. that assesses a sub- level of damage and that can be quantified. Um, and there's other other tests too where we look at uh, damage in other areas um, and also the stability of your tears. So if we were to do a staring contest now and everyone could do it at home, if you go blink, blink and hold your eyes open and start a time from your last blink, if you can make it to 10 seconds, uh, without without getting that first sort of stinging sensation that makes you want to go blink. So it's not about winning a staring contest, but if you make it to 10 seconds without any stinging sensation, there's a good chance that your your tear layer is 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 good quality and quantity. 
But if you're mm-hmm. underneath, so, and that this has been validated, and actually we've done this in a, in a, in a, in a, in a big <laughs> trial with, with with kids with gamers. So staring contest, ten seconds. The first moment you you you, you feel that that sting and sensation, if it's three or four or six seconds, you're likely to have a reduced quality or quantity tear tear foam. Oh, I hope I have a good quality uh, <laughs> layer oh. on my eyes. I'll, I'll... <laughs> minutes, um, minutes, Shane. <laughs> But okay, so you actually do find that gamers, uh, you've done these tests, uh, and yeah. you found that gamers terribleize. Is this oh, t- terrible layers? <laughs> well, what have you found? Yeah, this was a cool study we've done 2019, just before COVID, actually, uh, where we've gone to a gaming convention in, in Auckland, in New Zealand, and we've had about 500 uh, kids, average kids, average age 24, but half of them were under 18 gaming convention as you'd expect and we've done a couple of these validated tests and asked them to do a staring contest and we've gave them ipads to 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 fill out a questionnaire how much screen time do you do what do you eat Um, you know what are your symptoms and unbeknownst to them uh the front camera of the ipad was tracking their eyes and counting their blinks um so this was essential because if i tell you you know all right i'm gonna measure your blinking just blink normally now you'll do anything but right you'll be super aware of your blinking so it was essential that we do this in a, in a covert fashion um and we've seen some pretty pretty interesting uh, results and and associations correlations where the more screen time they did the, the poor the quality of tears they were the poor the symptoms the poor the blinking was so more screen time um poor everything um <laughs> I mean, this, you know, the, the average, average, uh, and, and, and aside from that, over 90% of the cohort uh, of these kids were, were considered symptomatic, positively symptomatic, according to our criteria for dry disease. And these were, you know, these were kids. So, um, but, you know, the average, the av- interesting is that the average um, report, self-reported screen time, weekly screen time was was 43, 44 hours. Um, this was before COVID, right? And this is just the average. There are kids who are, they're basically, you'd ask them, how much screen time do you do? And and they, you know, there's these 16 year olds and 13 year olds going, well, I sleep eight hours. So it must 24 hours. Well, it must mean, yeah, 16 hours of screen time, you say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's just think out loud. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, this was, this was, again, this was before COVID and since COVID, we've seen a lot, a lot of more, you know, sound evidence because it was, you know, for, for, for all, it was a horrible time. It was a pretty, uh, good breeding ground for, 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 for fairly controlled scientific experiments, but that stuff. Um, so we've seen significant increases in, in, in both dry disease, but also, but also myopia, which is, which is probably the more concerning one of, of the two. Uh, in, in, in relation to screen time and being inside. We can talk about that, but I don't want to hijack your questions. Or freak everyone out. <laughs> or freak everyone it, out, yeah. So to the the thing that I can do at home then is I can just blink incessantly as I'm doing work. And for myopia, can I just do eye exercises looking out at distant things? Or what, what, what can I do there? I mean, I think all hope is lost for you and I, Shane. I think we're uh, we're past the point, and we hopefully we should be fine. Your 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 eye growth phase is is, is pretty much uh, over. Um, I see. Um, it's you know, it's mostly the, the the younger people that are more more at risk, and where where balance is necessary. But balance is the key for all of us, I think. Um, What's essential for younger people again is 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 outdoor time. So natural sunlight, at least two hours a day. This is the the the, the recommended average. Uh, and yes, blinking is you know is a great habit. You you can retrain. And we've done a study where we've uh, where we've told people to do blink exercises, and it goes something like this: You blink normally, shut your eyes, close your eyes, open for a second, open your eyes, close them, and then squeeze, open again. Right. So that's that's one cycle. And what that what that does is remind you consciously and subconsciously of what full normal blinking feels like, but also squeezes those glands. Right. Mm. Uh, and we've told people to do this every 20 minutes of their waking hours for a month. It amounts to quite a lot of these about 40, 50 times a day. Uh, Thirty percent of the participants in that trial just dropped out after a week. They're like, "Bugger this! I'm not gonna do this. This is horrible." But people set themselves timers. There's apps you can put on your phone, your computer that go blink, blink. You can develop, you know, things like 
you know, training your breathing or your posture. Every time I click the mouse, I, and you can slowly train yourself. And we've seen significant improvements in both signs and symptoms in people who've taken deliberate practice to retrain their blinking. Um, in someone mm. who's, who's experiencing some issues with this, with extended screen time or with screen time, I feel like my eyes are constantly dry and it's annoying me. In someone who has absolutely no issue staring at a screen and not blinking for 20 hours a day, you know, there's probably not, nothing you, you need to do immediately. But but it's I think it's good to start this conversation and put put it on people's radars that what you do for a whole day actually actually matters. And when it comes to younger ones, uh, we should be a bit more mindful about letting them, you know, tick tock for five hours as much as that gives you a break. Mm. Uh, but it comes together with school time and leisure and everything else. Uh, there is increasing evidence. And this goes beyond just eyes, right? This is this is dry eye and myopia, but, but when we're looking at the broader literature of uh, health impacts of extended screen time in youth, there's a whole lot that's coming out in recent years in physical, so, so, in emotional, in social, in, um, you know, cognitive mm. and stuff like that. One of the things I've, we can get onto that a little bit, but one of the things I, I've noticed is, so when I, when I've got bad eyes, I, I might rub my eyes, say, mm. uh, is, I haven't really thought about this, but is that, um, is that like squeezing the oil out as well? Uh, is that it, good or bad or it's not do, great. Can you damage your eyes? Yeah. It's not yeah, great. Yeah. It's not recommended. Um, squeezing your eyes, oils is, is good. Squeezing your glands is good. Kind of like you do your dog's glands at the back, but that's a different story. Um, but I don't know anything about that. Good, good. Don't, <laughs> just don't. Yeah, we're, we're good. It's good. It's good that we keep uh, keep podcasts in uh, two dimensions, three. Um, we don't need smell. Um, squeezing your oil glands doesn't take much. It's ideally done just by squeezing your eyelids, like we've done before. Maybe you can just do a gentle massage if you if you need to. But rubbing your eyes isn't great because it it, it puts a lot of pressure on the eye and causes extra friction that the eye is not not designed for mm. uh, and then but there's other conditions such as keratoconus which is which is a condition affecting cornea where it, it starts thinning out that seems mm -hmm. to be associated with people rubbing their eyes a lot in their in their youth occasional rubbing sure fine but just 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 be aware that it's not the best you you can do because that that lube is not designed to withstand your strong arms yeah. <laughs> i i've spoken with people who have had eye surgery, so laser surgery, this yeah. sort of thing. And some of them mention that they get dry eyes from surgery itself. And this has always sort of confused me because, you know, the surgery isn't on their tear ducts. And it's, the surgery is also not on these, uh, now I know about them, these glands underneath your eyelids. Mm -hmm. So why why should you get dry eyes from a surgery like that? It, it, it appears to have to do with the fact that this kind of surgery, albeit minimally invasive, um, actually cuts through the nerves in your cornea, right? So we've mentioned it's the, the most densely innovative tissue in the, in, in the body. Um, and that's what's primarily driving the blink reflex. And funnily enough, in someone with dry eye, they're blink they will blink way more than a, than a healthy person because their nerves are constantly going, ah, 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 blink, 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 right? If you cut those nerves your cornea essentially goes numb um, in a sense, or it throws it out of, throws it out of whack. So that whole system of blinking, your you know your cornea basically goes, well, I don't need to blink because but but I'm fine. But in time, as those nerves grow back, the eye surface has experienced less blinking, has experienced damage as a result of less blinking because you've severed the connection that goes blink, blink, blink. So, so that's where the, the problem seems to lie. And yes, it's one of the most common uh, side effects, unfortunately, with, with, with laser surgery. And in people who already are predisposed to dry eye or experiencing dry eye, laser surgery can, can, can make it quite a bit worse. And is that permanent or eventually your cornea will... Uh, I don't think we have good long longitudinal data on this, but it, it can take quite a while to recover. And, and the, uh, the consensus is that, 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 yeah, it doesn't, doesn't fully come back. Uh, okay. So that, and that's because of the low vascular, I can't say the word vascularization yeah. of the uh, cornea. And so <laughs> this is sort of off topic uh, yeah. a little bit, I, just something I'm curious about. When people do, when people have eye surgery, how do they 
do, do you have anesthetic into the eye? How do you hold it in place? Like what goes on there? And when you're looking at an eye, how, how do you keep everything still? Uh, you'll, I think you'll, uh, you'll, uh, you'll get this quite well because it's, I mean, it's a bit of rocket science. The, the, the devices we use to perform these laser surgeries are super advanced tracking devices. So, so basically, yes, there's a local anesthetic, um, which is often just a drop, um, a liquid drop because only the surface needs to be numbed. Um, but then the actual laser that performs the surgery has another laser that, that keeps your eye, uh, keeps, keeps track of your eye. Yes, there is a suction device <coughs> in some devices that will just gently cup your eye and just keep it in place. But you're still aware, like you're not in, you know, full anesthesia. So full narcosis. Uh, so you can still move around. Of course, you're instructed to look straight ahead. But if you happen to do this a bit, that laser will, will correct or will, will stop. So, so it's a, it's a very subtle, Kind of like what I understand happens with with telescopes too, where you have to uh, keep things aligned in 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 a, in a very fine fashion. Um, I'm missing a keyword here, but you you get the gist. Um, mm. There is a secondary tracking system that directs the laser beam that performs the surgery um, to but account for the, for the moment. Of but for the suction, how long does that have to stay? Are people generally able to do that? It just sounds horrible. It have does, you but experienced it's, it? I've not. I've not had laser surgery. I've seen it done. It's 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 an order of seconds, really, up to a minute. It's okay. not long. Um, and as much as you you know you you might try to to focus and not move your eyes, there's there's uh, there's all sorts of eye movements, and some of them you cannot control, including micro tremor mm -hmm. and then saccades and stuff like that so some of the stuff you can't even consciously affect um so so okay so the software actually accounts for all of that yeah 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 i didn't know that so it's quite oh. it's quite advanced and and there's there's to my knowledge again this is not my area but this is not that is not an area um for issues or for problems um the system is quite good at detecting what is enough movement that it can tolerate accommodate keep doing the surgery or when it needs to shut off um yeah. so it's quite quite well controlled and it's quite amazing what we've come to do because this surgery used to be quite evasive um but now it's done as said in, a, in an order of minutes uh minimally invasive the, the the incision is super small um but can still lead to some of these side effects uh, but people are on the whole, quite happy with uh, with with laser eye surgery, I must say. If you know, if if you if you you know, you go to your reputed source and you invest uh, the right amount of money in it. Hmm. I, I know someone actually who had it done way too young, and it really messed up his eyes. Yeah, unfortunately, um, I, I don't know how old he was. He was like thirteen or something. Yeah. That's and, unfortunate. Yeah. Maybe it was done a while back. Back now, we kind of know that that eye growth needs to be completed, and that is in your, you know, early twenties. Um, so usually, a good good eye doctor will 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 uh, advise against getting surgery done before that, um, yeah. especially if your if the, your eye growth has not been stable for for many years. Um, it's not something you should you should choose to do, um, and all sorts of other kind of contraindications, such as if you have a very unfortunately if you have a very high prescription, if you have thick eyeglasses, you have minus thirteen or seventeen or twelve, you are the most desperate person to get laser eye surgery. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. you're not the right candidate. You're not the best candidate because what happens in that sort of growth is your cornea is is thinner, so you need a certain thickness, a minimal thickness of cornea for the laser to be laser surgery to be safe and 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 and, and um uh, effective mm. yeah i mean this guy's now in his late 20s i think and so yeah. it can't have been too long ago it's a bit yeah. sad actually that you go in to improve your eyes you end up with permanently damaged yeah, yeah. it is a pity and in in clinical and advanced clinical uh practice or institutes that deal with, i mean there's a whole host of institutes that deal with uh with patients of you know laser surgery or or or, or 
you know, messed up corneas from contact lens wear or stuff like that, 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 that deal with these patients who then are basically sentenced. It's not that they'll lose their vision, but they're essentially sentenced to wearing specialty contact lenses, rigid contact lenses uh, for life. Uh, they can give you your vision back quite, quite well, but 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 they're but they they can be quite a burden um, before you need to get a corneal transplant, and even if you do, then you're still um, dependent on these on these contact lenses. Uh, quite amazing tool. So let me ask you about tears because <laughs> I I, <laughs> I have some relatively dumb questions about tears. Um, oh, sure you do. <laughs> One of the things I want to know is, so I understand why when our our eyes irritated, we we might cry, you know, to, to flush out, mm. um, uh, you know, a, a, any debris that might be uh, stuck in our eyes. But I don't understand why we cry when we're sad. Like, do, do you do you know the? Is there some well understood reason? No. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to dig through. Um, no, I mean, I can riff and, and no, I, I, I don't. It may be something more with, to do with empathy and, and, and with, with the way, I mean, it's a sort of a social mechanism, I think, in the same way that you know, having big eyes or, or the soft blink that cats now seem to do to now they've always done it. Apparently <laughs> when, you know, when, when someone falls in love with you or wants to charm you, they'll, they'll blink more softly. Um, um, the uh, people back in the day, medieval times even would get these extracts, belladonna that, that it causes your pupils to dilate because it's, it makes your eyes prettier. And I, you know, I, I wonder whether there's some, some, um, some similarly, similar, you know, evolution, evolutionary process wherein tears streaming down your face. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but so do, do tears of sadness and, and grief and joy and, of cleansing your eyes out, they all come from the same place, right? It's the same tears. They do, yeah, yeah, yeah. They all come. So, so there's there's various glands involved in the production of tears. The main component being aqueous tears, um, and there we have these main tear glands, which are just behind our eyebrows, inside in the in the mm -hmm. skull, uh, and they produce the water component. There's some mothers down here that kind of like a backup function excuse me but um and then there's your oil glands and then there's there's this goblet cells which are on the eye surface on the conjunctive on the white part that produce the mucins so these are the three main components if you will mucins that are thick gooey stuff that pro pro provide a foundation of the tears then you have your watery layer on top and then there's a lipid layer very thin lipid layer 40 80 100 nanometers thick um, that seals this whole thing off and provides lubrication. And in within that, we've ident identified upwards of 3,000 individual components, salts, proteins, lipids, antibacterial, antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory agents. There's, there's a bazillion stuff. It's a highly complex liquid. Um, but all of these tears of, from different emotions, including tears of onions uh, you've evoked, basically all come from the same gland. There's some really cool and cute um, stuff that's been published and people taking tears from these various scenarios and, and imaging them and running microscopy slides and showing pretty cool optical effects with quite stark differences. I don't think there's any... Uh, physiological basis to the differences we see between the different states we're in uh, but it was quite striking that tears angry tears uh did look like uh, you know a, a horror movie scene and tears of grief were something more transcendental but uh yeah yeah it's all water with stuff <laughs> <laughs> but do, do i have so when i'm crying yeah am i producing tears uh, are, are the various glands producing tears sort of at that point or do I have a supply of tears that's ready to go on command? What, what's... Oh, good question. I, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. 
I don't think <laughs> there is a. Uh, yeah, that is a really good question. I don't think we have a sack of tears ready to go at all times. <laughs> um, Can you milk someone's tears? Let's like try. when you're so uh, you're, you're doing think. these. Uh, how often these... do you cry, Shane? How? how, how... This is I, I need to know this for a friend. Ah, the... of course. yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, no, because obviously someone had to, someone has to do research on on tears, and mm. so in you, you have some in the laboratory. You you put your little stool beside them, and you you milk. How how do you <laughs> do you poke them? Do you annoy them, or do you spray <laughs> onions? And <laughs> yeah, and, and how uh, these are the important questions. How much tears could you get out of someone if you really again for a friend? Ah, uh, pints, just gallons. Uh, I, I don't know. We've not teased it out, but but probably quite a, quite a bit because uh, uh, it's. Uh, I mean, you talk to brain people, and they'll say something like eighty percent of everything we know or we are is visual. So so your eyes will do whatever is needed to 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 produce tears to keep your eyes uh, nice and moist. Um, we do have clinical tests where we milk people's eyes, um, and that usually involves placing a thin strip of paper just like a like a quite rough piece of paper uh just in here and then have them close their eyes so just something to irritate their eyes and then that sort of measures the amount of tears and it's 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 kind of like millimeter paper where you have um lines drawn this is a 200 year old test so it's a strip it's like five centimeters long and within five minutes you need to see a certain length of that strip being wet it's filter paper um, mm -hmm. so that actively stimulates the production of tears um, and in someone who doesn't produce those tears there's uh there's you know a, a either a dysfunction in the lack of apparatus and the production of the tears um an ability or insufficiency of tears or they are insensitive um they they their corneal their innervation um is is not quite up to pop, up up to scratch scratch yeah um so yeah these these are tests we can do to to, to trigger the production of tears but uh in terms of producing the the type of quantities you see when you cry we don't really have that there are recently there's been uh, there's been some interesting devices coming this market claiming to to, to manage uh, dry eye or other ocular surface conditions that rely on production of tears where they essentially are intranasal stimulators. So so think of a uh, kind of like a thermometer, if you will, but with a two, two prong thermometer that goes up your nose and then it, it delivers a, a very small amount of electrical current that will um, cause your, your tears just go uh, because it's all connected and inter innervation the nose is connected to the eye. So you, you can do that. Um, See, this is what I was hoping to hear. Uh, you know, how do you produce tears in, in the lab? Oh, we, we chuck paper inside their eyes and irritate them. But I, I'm much more impressed with a, <laughs> a device you can stick up someone's nose and shock them into crying. Uh, yeah. so it sounds sadistic, but it's more impressive somehow. Yeah, yeah. I think there's been a few trials on this. It's quite new. Just in the last couple of years, it came out. Uh, I think it's available for, for, for sale or for uh, for clinical applications. I'm not sure people take it home. It might be an in-office treatment, uh, but I think it's currently confined to the United States, of course. Um, so if anyone's curious, I'm, I might try to put that in the description below if, yeah, <laughs> if yeah, it's available. Yeah. <laughs> but um. Another, I'm not sure that you'll have the answer to this question because it's sort of outside of field a little bit, perhaps. But um, you know, why do we have to have wet eyes? I, I, I by that I mean, you know, the, there's insects that don't have eyelids, and and I think there's lizards as well. Like, is it just a quirk of evolution where we came from, or you know, why why is it? that uh all mammals for example or but did we come from something that i asked the question because just to give you an example of where i'm trying to go with this um snails for example used to i think they, they're sort of related to mollusks things that were living in the sea so they they have a shell that uh they can enclose sort of liquid within the shell did I, our eyes evolve from a creature that lived underwater and that's why we have to have wet eyes? Do you, do you yeah. know? 
Yeah, I think I think you're you're spot on with uh, with this being a a question for an evolutionary biologist, which I'm not, and be uh, a a function of the environment you've you've evolved in. And I think, uh, and then the C would be the the you know the sort of the the, the complexity and the efficiency that any one organism would would afford uh, themselves. So a fly would obviously have a uh, a much simpler, if you will, uh, visual system and processing, but it will be very good at some things. So not great at detecting color, as far as we know, but great at detecting motion. Um, but I guess for for humans, the way we've evolved in our environment, this seems to be the most efficient way. Um, when you look at, as you've mentioned, you know, some reptiles, snakes, for instance, will have will have their their eyelid they'll still have an eyelid but it's grown transparent um mm -hmm. right uh and one of my former colleagues in canada has done some pretty cool work where uh he's accidentally discovered um that these fully transparent uh, membranes or eyelids if you will that we just assume to be kind of like a second cornea with probably some tears behind so the eye was moist behind but because they were a lot in water there was never a need to open it so it sealed shut actually had some uh, they started growing blood vessels through that transparent eyelid that were mostly invisible because they were empty so there was no no blood flowing through in a and depending on their state of relaxation, fight or flight, um, they would be they would be able to control the blood flow, depending on whether they were relaxing or 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 hunting prey, and that would actually help them sharpen their vision. So they would. And because because all of our investigations will, were done, you know, with a snake caught in a tube and shining a light they were always kind of you know in that certain state so it took a long time for, for for this guy to actually get to a relaxation state to see the different states of fl blood flow and he actually found i think that that influences the optics so you can get into you know refraction and diffraction and stuff like that uh based on the density of these blood vessels and the level of blood that they fill themselves with uh, in order to to suit their visual tasks so so i think in in the animal kingdom there there is a lot of variation between I, and and again this is not my area but variation between these two poles of what's most efficient and what's mm -hmm. needed from my environment uh slash my survival for instance, we know that that eagles or hawks would would tend to, you know, on your retina, you would have a fovea, a central point where your sharpest vision is, right? Where you read, where you look, where you look, that's where your sharpest vision is. And anywhere outside of that, your vision is quite crap. Like if you hold out an arm out here, you can obviously see it. You look straight ahead, you see your hand, but you can't count the number of fingers. Like your peripheral vision is crap. Well, hawks and eagles will have two foveas that seem to be placed. You know how they spiral down onto their prey. Mm -hmm. That the radius of that spiral uh, has to do with the distance between these two foveas, and there's some weird logarithmic function that dictates their sharpest vision being maintained at all times as they circle their 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 way down to the to the, to the rabbit or the mouse down there. So there's all sorts of quirks like that, as you've said, that we find, and I think I think the wet eye. And the tears uh, are, are are part of that. It's probably that we can afford that luxury to keep our eyes shut at night, um, and then have nice, clear, uh, relatively good vision um, during the day when we need to, um, and not deal with. No, I, I, I was just curious because in preparation for this talk, I was thinking about, you know, fish, for example, don't seem to have eyelids, but they're mm. underwater. Mm. Uh, where they where they have liquid against um, their eye, and then it's sort of like semi aquatic things like crocodiles. They seem to also have eyelash uh, eye, um, eyelids, yeah. and so I was imagining that um, it's primarily 
for whatever reason, yeah, they're, they're primarily to keep your eyes moist rather than protection, it seems. Because otherwise, why wouldn't fish have them? Mm. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I guess also uh, you could go, I mean, when we build telescopes, like the one you've got behind you in, in frame, we do that out of glass, I guess. You, we could have had like crystal eyes, for example. That we could have gone down a completely different evolutionary path. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And I think I think it all revolves around uh, or, or it comes down to the requirement of transparency, really. You need mm -hmm. tissue that is transparent. And that's physiologically quite tough to achieve. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I guess it's easier underwater uh, because your refractive indices will be will be more matched. But 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 on on the eye, you need you know that cornea, which which is avascular, as we've said, uh, needs some pretty special conditions to receive its oxygen to make sure that you know the metabolic metabolic byproducts can get out, uh, so it's being fed from behind. Uh, from within the eye, but also the tears at the front provide uh, some oxygen, some 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 protection. So, I think I think that's where it's at. And and the tears also do do quite a bit in terms of refractive power too. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, as of as as far as an optic optical apparatus goes, the eye yeah, there's there's different layers to that. Um, and it must be said that in 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 pure terms of optics or, or or imaging, if you will, the eye as an optical apparatus is pretty crap. I think our, the estimates we have for the quality of the image you get, you perceive, you know, mm -hmm. visually is uh, is mostly driven by the brain. So so the, eye, the quality image that gets to the back of the eye at your optic nerve or out of the eye is 10% of what we actually see. The rest 90% is, is done by the brain. So, so, so your, 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 your visual cortex does, does the heavy lifting when it comes to using, uh, the pretty crappy image that our eyes get. How, how do they know that? How, how do they know how much information is coming down? Get, can, can they measure what's coming down the optic nerve or how, how do they know it's 10%? That's, I, that's amazing. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, this is a, 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 a um, a cheeky number I've 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 remembered and and uh, I can't give you the answer to that. I know that we can measure electrical currents and there's a whole there's a whole heap of uh, of, of uh, modeling of mathematical modeling that some of my colleagues do. I absolutely do not understand it. Um, maybe so maybe it's they can look at the number of sites in the retina that uh, pick up light and then they can get some sort of estimate at, of uh the resolution for instance yeah yeah and there's you know there's there's in vitro work you can do you can culture some of these cells and you know the retina is not just you know ccd receptors like there's 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 different layers and different cells and receptors that deal with that have different functions from light intensity to orientation to color to direction to all of these things and they're you know they i, I guess they can be taken apart and a rough picture of what <laughs> what the, what the image at the back of the eye is can be extrapolated and might not might be very precise but 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 in general or overall um i think we we have a pretty solid understanding that that the brain does and and this can be derived off of animal models too if you you know if you uh take uh, say a mouse or or a, or 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 a, or a chick and you deprive them of of certain visual st stimuli or or evolution you could look at um the, the 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 electrical currents that come through and the tissue and how that that evolves and what happens in the brain um, and kind of piece that together this is again this is far outside of my field but i'm, I'm aware that this kind of work is, is is going on and this is where where we get this kind of information if you look at it inside the eye it's i mean it's not great uh the, the if you look at the retina all the receptors are at the back so the image this is your eye. This is your pupil. The light comes in through your eye, and then all your receptors are at at the back here. And but the, but the receptors actually at at the other side, and the cables are sticking out through the eye, and then the cables are pushed aside around your fovea for the, for the light to actually come through. Now it turns out that that seems to have some protective function, but it's it's not a it doesn't seem to be a smart or or the optimal solution. 
but it does seem to be efficient enough that the brain can take whatever poor signal that comes out and still give us this 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 really good image we have um and and if you look at the evolution and start intervening so taking tricks or taking animal models and and depriving certain certain things um you can get more information out of that and 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 you know you 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 think of the if you look at a range of mountains uh and they uh, they're you know they're they're increasing or decreasing um hues of gray um you see depth like you literally see 3d but that's learned that's acquired um because because you've seen and you know that the decreasing intensity of of color means depth right but 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 without experience you wouldn't wouldn't know that. and that's nothing to do with optics um, that's just to yeah. do with uh, with with the brain and then and then it moves on from there to motion and and and, and other aspects of vision so we're more or less hallucinating the world around us uh, uh, pretty much yeah yeah it turns out that the <laughs> that the that the bottom periphery of our of our receptors and and our visual field uh, is actually geared towards detecting snakes in the in, in the grass which is which is quite nuts so the patterns on a lot of a uh, lot of snake species um the bottom part of your visual field is more attuned to that motion and those patterns because we've been running and, and dying off of snakes for millions of years also we are more more receptive to hues of gr uh, green so out of the whole color spectrum we're pretty poor at seeing blue so blue is is, is worse because there's not a lot of blue in the world there's the sky there's mm. the there's the water and then uh but green we have we have the finest finest tooth comb for 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 for, for shades of green and if you look at yeah. um, if you look at literature if you go back into the earliest books and you track the occurrence of colors red was the first color that ever came up reds like the fire red like your lips red like blood red like whatever and then there's all the other colors yellow like the sun and the flowers and green and leaves and blah blah blah, blah, blah amongst you know hundreds of years as they've emerged in the first writings and then there's a massive gap of many many years until blue comes up as a color because other than a few flowers there's not there's no there's not much blue so people just took it for granted the sky was either gray or just is and the water just is so so there's yeah there's, there's a, copper <laughs> copper yeah i guess yeah it, it makes me wonder you know um so our brain is responsible for constructing the image and it does an excellent job with what sound like terrible eyes <laughs> well not terrible eyes but what could be better perhaps mm. and does this fact sometimes do, do you ever see well not patients but do you ever see people or hear of people who who have deteriorating vision but they don't notice for years because their brain is is doing a lot of the heavy lifting uh is, is this something that can happen kind of there's a lot of conditions that that sneak up on you um that are blinding conditions um that you don't notice because um well take glaucoma right so glaucoma is mm -hmm. is increased pressure in your eye and your receptors at the back of the eye starts dying off kind of like those cells in your myobobin glands that um die off because of pressure <clears throat> and that starts to happen from from the periphery and and it's the world's one of the world's leading blinding conditions particularly in the de um, developing world because you don't notice it until it's too late until you're left with tunnel vision because if you lose a bit of your vision out here you might not notice it because it's just not you're not just really you're really not aware at some point you start bumping into open drawers and into things because oh i didn't see that there but it's progressive <clears throat> it's irreversible and yes at some point you may be ending with uh but um other than these these pathological conditions, um, I'm not aware uh, of that being a a a I guess you wouldn't know, right? I guess you wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to be you'd have to be quite uh, quite aware. And then again, it's it's you know, many people might live with uh, with with very different visual experiences um that might not flag up and we might not be able to compare 
if we don't do a lot of tests. So short of losing their sight, uh, they might be colorblind. And I, I mean, I've met, you may have met people who are in their 40s and 50s and they never knew they're slightly, co not colorblind, but color deficient, right? So uh, it's all subjective. Um, luckily, we, you know, mostly agree that red is red and that is a square and, you know, but, but uh, slight distortions, um, that's not necessarily pathological leading to blinding or, or, or visual, um, visual disability might be something that you can live with for a long, long time, and uh, it may come up randomly at some point or not. So I have two final questions that I want to ask you. Yeah. And so one of them is a little bit silly. I just am curious what your answer would be. <laughs> um, but that is, would it be an honor for you to have a disease named after you? Like, does this happen in the literature and are people happy about this? Or is it something that's avoided? Uh, I want to say that the, those times are gone. <coughs> uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I certainly wouldn't be worthy of it. Uh, but I, I'd like to name a mite after me. I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that would be nice. Yeah. So if you find a, a mite, you want someone to name that after you if, if, uh, if possible. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. The months might. The months might. The monster. Would you... <laughs> because, you know, it's a bit unfair, right? Like if, if you, uh, in other fields, you discover a bug or you discover, yeah. you know, some equation or whatever it is. But yeah. if you dis discover a disease, it, it's not as nice to have that named after you. I some guess condition so. that really harms I, a lot of people. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, it might be a, yeah, it's probably a, a big dream for many of the, of the big names. I've not thought about it. I feel like I need to dedicate 50 years to, uh, to do that. But yeah, it would be nice. I mean, yeah, just, just, you know, <laughs> just, just call me. Whoever finds something and they come up with a, with a, with a random name that they're not happy about, I'll, I'll, I'll donate my name. Uh, yeah, take credit. But then, but then, you know, 10 years down the line, they'll, it'll be, it'll turn out that it's, it's all misunderstood and that you get canceled and then your statue gets torn, torn down. Uh, I don't want any of that. But a might you don't you don't want the name of your mites ripped off you yeah 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 no just 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 <laughs> just, just just go with <laughs> oh so there's not much left to discover i'd say no 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 there's there's, there's heaps to, to discover still in the human body even what was that we found a new organ that we never thought existed just a couple of years ago yeah i don't know but i, I mean i had never heard of, of these uh sacks underneath the eyelids i'm sure there's stuff like this all over the body that we don't know about yeah yeah, no, but I mean, I mean, so like genuinely in 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 the literature, in our understanding of the human body, there's there's an organ we weren't aware of uh, five years ago. It came out. It's like, oh, there's this thing, and does this. It's like, oh, what? <laughs> oh, yeah, this was here all along. Uh, it's not that you and I haven't heard of it. It's just like we, no one knew. Hmm. Um, but but so as a sort of final wrap up question, uh, sort of just in you know, what is it that you wish people knew about eye health? Like if, if there's that one one thing that you could recommend or that, that one uh, piece of advice ab about looking after our eyes, um, you know, so that they can avoid uh, ending up in a clinic at some point. Is, mm. is there, mm. it, it, maybe with, with respect to dry eye or just in general, is there mm. something that you'd recommend for people? Yeah, for um, sure, for sure. Um... I, I keep thinking back to my dentist who I have asked, I was like, oh, do I really need to floss like every day? It's like, always. And he's like, no, no, you only need to floss the teeth you want to keep. That's, that's all. It's like, and that stuck with me. It's like, oh, okay. Um, but in that, in that sense, I think the best thing you could do, and it, again, it comes down to kids, uh, is is um, is treating treating your eyes a bit like uh, like you do treat your teeth, and developing mm -hmm. that that preventive uh, prophylactic approach, where you where you think of having your eyes checked, just like you do your teeth from early on, and mm -hmm. go in for your yearly or two yearly check. Because of our environments having changed so much in recent times, not just digitally, but also being inside. And again, these, and we've not touched on this, but, but staying inside, depriving 
young children of natural sunlight for for days on end and having them do near work no matter what it is but it tends to be screen time these days um significantly drives eye growth and myopia is irreversible and it's not just glasses myopia does lead to glaucoma and cataracts and macular degeneration because that ultimately can lead to, to tension at the back of the eye that rips that retina, right? So that's blinding disease. People don't know about this, right? So myopia or oh, short-sightedness, I'll, I'll just get glasses or I'll get laser surgery and I'll be sorted. You can't sort it. There's no glasses. There's no surgery that will deal with a, with a torn retina. And that starts in early years. So as, 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 as young as two, three, four, five, you know, it's 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 a good idea for parents to take their kids in just for routine checks and making sure they go back every year, every two years to keep track of the natural and healthy development of their uh, kids eye growth, because left too late in the teens, 20s, you go to school, you go to university, it's like, oh, I can't really see the blackboard anymore. You might get glasses. Uh, but we now have uh, treatments and and approaches to not to stop it or to reverse it but to slow it down to slow that that progression mm -hmm. and if it's too late there's, there's nothing you can do um, and that's 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 even just wearing glasses having to wear glasses be it minus three or minus five it you know it can be a burden um on quality of life before it gets to pathological conditions such as such as what we call high myopia and i guess also with children if they can't see and you don't know, then they're not going to learn as well because they're not going to be able to see the ball. Absolutely. To... Absolutely. Like short sightedness is on a global scale is the greatest disability burden we have on economy, on productivity. We have something like 1.8 billion people that are essentially disabled who would just need glasses. And out of those, a significant proportion are legally blind because of high levels of, 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 of refractive air that can be treated with strong glasses and that I, the numbers are striking i forget what they are but in terms of uh, impact on the economy productivity and so forth there's insane things we could do with just a pair of glasses uh and in parts of parts of the very developed world parts of asia particularly because there's this other risk factors there uh teenagers proportions in 99 up to 100 percent have myopia um, singapore south korea parts of china um prevalence of myopia has has really skyrocketed and at a global level where we're talking about you know another epidemic or a epidemic of, of, of myopia where by the age, by the year 2050 the who has predicted a couple of years ago that half of the world's population would be myopic now it turns out that that estimate is very conservative so we're all on track to develop that um, and it's as simple as getting enough sunlight and not uh, doing uh, insane amounts of screen time from or near work sorry which is screen time um from early on uh, wait 99 percent of people yeah. in southeast asia have myopia yeah teenagers so kids um that's insane it is it is it is and, and you know what's interesting <laughs> so, yeah parts of it absolutely like very developed urban urban spots will will, will, will boast those numbers um and for the longest time, our understanding was that, you know, myopia is, you know, primarily an Asian, Asian condition because there, you know, there's some genetic predisposition in, 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 in Asian people for myopia. Well, it turns out that that uh, has nothing or very little to do with that. Obviously, if both of your parents are highly myopic, your risk of developing myopia will be huge. But screens have been around for only a couple of years. Mm. But this myopic increase traces back to the culture of revolution where in in parts of asian china specifically people have been you know brought from 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 rural living into 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 cities with with insane pressures to perform be it in school or at work and near work and staying inside has really skyrocketed and that's where where, where it all started it coincides with the cultural evolution not the appearance of screens screens have just added another layer on top because now we're all stuck inside and doing screen time and take that a couple of generations back and you can see how it becomes an asian condition but there's no you know i mean we can talk about race theory and stuff there's no scientific backing for the notion that there's a gene in asian people that predisposes them it's lifestyle 
and this is increasingly what we're understanding about this and other conditions, dry disease included too, that it uh, lifestyle choices do actually have have a have a great effect. And you know, we get into epigenetics and how genes get get triggered by 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 the way you live your life. So um, so that's why I think we need to be a bit more cautious and and not alarmist, but just making sure that we're on top of things. I mean, you get your warrant of fitness for your car, for God's sakes, every year. You should do that for your eyes, your teeth, and your mental health, and probably many other things. Prostate exams. Uh, <laughs> <early> <laughs> on, <you know? laughs> Did you want to end the podcast on prostate exams? Yes. Yeah. 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 Let's let's do that. I was uh, I was warned <laughs> about that today when I went to the police station to pick up my new passport, and I presented a. I, my ID that I had trimmed so it fits my wallet and the, and the cop was really mad at me and said you shouldn't do this this is a felony because it's a legal document any alterations is you know you, you can get fined um, and and he and he you know he made it clear that he'll forgive me um, but he's told me that if you get uh, get stopped somewhere in a different country you can get you can you can go to prison and you know what they'll do they'll uh, they'll 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 strap a glove and you'll get a rectal exam and it'll be over it'll be over so all of a sudden monday morning 8 a.m i was in this and this very weird conversation with the police officer uh, about me. the long arm of the law so to speak <laughs> <laughs> well on that note on that wonderful scientific note <laughs> it's been a pleasure alex likewise thanks for likewise. coming on the podcast thank you shane